and welcome back to yet another review. Today we're going to be having a look at the second film in the Lone Wolf and Cub series, Baby Cart, The River Sticks. Trying to get through all of these for you, but so following on from the first film, Sword of Vengeance, we're we'll looking at the second one today. Made in 1972, again start starring Tomisaburo Wakayama as Ogami Ito, who has chosen to walk the demon path in hell with his young son. Uh, the film was, was used as sort of the bulk um, for the Western distributors um, for Shogun Assassin. Uh, this was They used the bulk of this movie um, in order to sort of make Shogun Assassin, which was used for sort of Western audiences, which come out in 1980. Uh, it's even referenced uh, at the end of Kill Bill Volume 2. Um, the clan from the first film are still trying to take Ito down using like female assassins. Also, Ogami accepts to kill a member of a clan who has the secret to this sort of die making, uh, which is the Shogun get hold of it would increase their profits and is protected by the Monks of Death, uh, known as the Hidori Brothers who wield spike fist, clubs and claw. Many say the film is the quintessential uh, Lone Wolf and Cub movie. A lot of people say, if, you know, if anything else, this is the one that you've got to see. And in many, isn't like... Overall, I do agree with that sentiment. I think if you're going to watch any of the movies, it's definitely this is one of the ones that you should watch. I mean, like, um, you know, most people, if they know of Lone Wolf and Cub, have usually seen Shogun Assassin, but this is the film they took the bulk of that film for because Shogun Assassin is sort of the first film, the second film they sort of done like a sort of a hybrid to make Shogun Assassin. But if you do watch any Lone Wolf and Cub movies, Make sure to check out uh, Baby Cart the River Sticks because this is the one that uh, is probably it's definitely maybe made, uh, the most popular one of them all. Um, as I say, many say it is the quintessential movies. Um, you can also see in this film where John Carpenter may have inspired quite a lot. Um, you know, for what he got in Big Trouble in Little China. A lot more fights and bloodletting in this movie as compared to, say, Sword of Vengeance. A lot more cartoony, zany sort of action set pieces that um, the action is a lot more frequent in this movie as opposed to Sword of Vengeance. Um, it's um, where the first film, it just sets up uh, the narrative here. Very much you know you know who Ito is. You know um, sort of the, you know why he's walking the demon path in hell with his son. So you you that's already been established. So they can sort of have fun with it now and just like let more fight sequences and things happen. A lot more atmospheric, I would say so as well in this movie. Um, so we see Ito and Daigoro living off the land, following on from events of the first film, sitting around a fire. Then they go to an inn. The owner doesn't want them there, thinking they're like Ronin and they're just going to cause trouble. They're no good. What you know? Why are you coming into my inn? Uh, but once um, Ito gives him money, agrees that they can just stay anyway. Um, we then have a great shot of them bathing. Um, and it's a very interesting shot, um, this scene, because um, they're both in, like, sort of, uh, this barrel of water together, just sort of facing each other. And they do, and the camera does, like, this 360-degree shot round them both a couple of times. Um as if, as if, like we're at the centre of the tool of the two, and it's always like a close up of their eyes when they sense something. If they sense something's going to happen, or if they sense people are near, because they can both sort of sense if there's going to like assassins or people approaching them, or you know they're about to be attacked. They can usually um, detect um, something's going on. So it's a very if you watch that scene, it's very it's very clever what's happening there. Um, Showing they always have to be on their guard. I mean, it's a very intimate scene. That's the wonderful thing about these movies. You get, um, you get, you know, you get really violent stuff. You get limbs being chopped off. You get, you know, people being beheaded. You get people having their legs chopped off. God knows what. You know, this is. They are violent films, but at the same time, especially with, like I say, Ito and his son, there's this real intimacy that you get uh, with between the two and this dynamic that they have. This very strong sense of closeness and bonding. Um, so we go to this all-female clan who are part of the Yagyu clan who betrayed him in the first film. A clan reports Ito's activities to her and so they can prove and show their skills. They say, sort of, who is your best man? Like, Because they're like an all-female and they're like, who's your best man? We'll show you our skills, what we can offer, what, you know, how skilled we are, you know, our talents and how, you know, mercilessly, like, we can kill people. So this guy ends up cut, gets his nose cut off, his ear calf, leg, arm. I mean... You know, at this point, I was just thinking, what on earth is going to fall on the floor next? You know, what on earth are they going to cut off next? Because this guy was just getting everything cut off of him. It was like, it's just falling on the floor, you know. But, yeah, everything just, like, I, it just went on and on. I mean, she laughs all proud, but... At the end, she's like, yeah, no, look look, look how skilled we are. But, I mean, it was like one versus eight. I mean, the guy stood no chance whatsoever. You know, to, in all fairness, let's not blow, you know, trumpet too strong here because, 
it was all of you versus one. So the guy didn't stand much of a chance anyway. He just walked straight into his death. Um, he didn't stand much of a chance. So basically, people put up demon symbols if they want to hire Ogami. Um, he leaves like a map trail on the ground and with stones and rocks as to where they can find him. So they, they put if people around want to hire him for his services, there's like demon symbols. And if... if like I mean, so if he sees these, he will leave like rocks where like a trace where like they, like a map where they can sort of find him, and if they want to recruit his skills for whatever it may be, because like he's a sword for hire, um, you know, and that's where he gets his money and his um, payments from. Um, a clan contacts him again, where here he again has to prove his skill um, by throwing a sword across the room and killing like a spy outside. We learn that the Shogun want their dye recipe to cause an uprising and use the money they make from it to sort of take over. Um, yeah, it's very much rooted in they've got this dye. Shogun want to get hold of it so they can make profit, which will give them more money, so they therefore would have more control. That's sort of the plot here with the film and what's going on. Um, executed all the spies in the area, and one of them leaves in an attempt to give the recipe sort of to the Shogun. And this is who like Ito has to sort of execute. That's sort of he's the main man he's after here because one of them's sort of gone rogue. He's gone to the Shogun. He's been protected by them, looked after by them. So that's who he's gone after. Like he needs to execute. Um, we find out that he is going to be protected by Tenma Karuma and like um, Iron Claws, who use like um, flying maces, iron fists, and then they're, like, they're known as the Monks of Death and told they're on this ship. Um, we then get the female clan trying to attack Ito, pretending to be like street performers and such. At one point, even seeing the blade cut through a woman's breast. Even Daigoro presses a button on the cart that stabs one of them. Like Even his son is helping him kill people and take out these assassins. So even the son is like, you know, he's already a killer at the very young age. Um, then the leader comes out to Yaka. And she uses like a net after being overpowered. She sort of runs away. And it's a really weird shot that she... It's probably the most bizarre shot in the whole movie. Like, she tries to, like, trap him in this net. He sort of gets the upper hand and obviously unaware that, like, well, totally aware now she can't beat him or can't overpower him. She sort of runs backwards. It's a really weird scene, but she sort of... Obviously, it was shot with her running forwards, but she sort of runs backwards across, the like, the hills and everything so she doesn't take her eyes off of it. So it's a really peculiar shot, but in the funny sort of way, it sort of works and with the scene don't ask me why um then the clan who recruited the females comes out and the cart gets pushed like like ito sense sees them and he pushes the cart with Daigo in it right at them and the blades sort of come out the wheels and it sort of takes off their just cuts them down basically at the legs of the feet um just hacks them away you can you know you can see as well in this film I know I mentioned earlier about Big Trouble in Little China, but if you recall like, um, with my Ninja Scroll review, it's very much you can see where inspiration from Lone Wolf and Cub went into Ninja Scrolls because it does have that sort of feel about it. There is that sense of, um, I'm sure this was very much part and inspiration in the movie of Ninja Scroll and just what they were going for and the, definitely the kind of feel they were going for in the sense of um, like the assassins and the villains and just the overall tone of the narrative and just how it works and how um, you know these people interact with each other. So Ito is wounded from all this fighting and he goes to rest in like this hut where Daigoro looks after him and nurses him. I'm able to. There's a wonderful little scene where he's he keeps trying to get some water. He's trying to pick up water, and he he can't work out how I'm gonna because he has no cups or like flask or anything he can put the water in. So he's struggling, and this is—it's a really sweet scene between like father and son. That you know, it kept falling through his hands. This water keeps leaking. So what he does is he puts it in his mouth. He carries it. He carries the water in his mouth, and ends up that's the way he feeds his father. Like he gives his father a drink because he sort of lets it, sort of spits it back into his mouth. And it's a really, like I mentioned earlier, that intimacy that they have, that bonding that they have, really does shine through in this movie regardless of all the violence and all the limbs being cut off as I say um, you know really tender moments interwoven with all this bloodshed um, he brings him food that was left for Buddha um, at one point he even takes off I think he takes off his robe as sort of a replacement because it was made for it was left for Buddha and um, he just does that as a sort of um, way to sort of replace the food that he has taken 
The evil clan basically that's after them plan to kidnap him. They lure Agami out and dangle Daigoro over a well. Um, he manages to save him with the help of Sayaka, the, fem the lead female assassin, the main one, who stopped his son hitting the bottom. Uh, maybe she thought it was just to, like a too cowardly like tactic to use you know, the son in order to get to the father, in order to get the upper hand. Um, you know, and I think that's the wonderful thing. Like, this woman, she was making out, like, she's the top dog. She is the main, uh, like, villain here. But she, even she weakens. Like, she's, like, she stops, like, Daigoro from dying. She does help. Um, as I say, maybe she thought it was too cowardly. Uh, then we are on board the ship where the monks of death are, where um, some thugs attack them so we can see their skills and how brute they are. And um, they get to show off, you know, some, you know, violent stuff because it's like they are sort of renowned um and you know around and it's them that are sort of protecting the guy who's sort of gone against um you know the the, the good guys who have their sort of die recipe eventually the ship is set alight and all manage to escape sayaka goes to actually to still assassinate um ito but he um manages to overpower underwater and he sort of takes her with them and again um you know like i said earlier about that intimacy they all wet and they find shelter and at one point he she thinks he's going to rape her because he's like ripping her clothes off and you think and as an audience you're you're thinking what is he going to do is he going to assault her what's happening here because they're all soaked to the bone he strips his clothes off and he's and um he then he explains it's better to like share body heat because they have no fire like they've got to keep warm and um it's the only way they're going to sort of survive because they have no sort of fire and means of heat and at first she goes for a sword when they're hugging, like they're close together. She sort of goes to reach for a sword. But then this calmness overcomes her. She gets um, this sense of sort of calm and tranquility where she sort of lets go. Um, the, she's Like I say, she's almost like she's overwhelmed by the closeness and comfort of all. You know, she really does feel, <coughs> excuse me, sort of um, uh, at ease all of a sudden, even though she's trying to kill him. She at that point there's they she there's that closeness again between the three of them, which is it's a really tender moment. Um we then cut to the desert where they are escape like escorting the traitor, um and like they're piercing the dunes with, with claws and there's people hiding inside um the sand dunes and it like sort of leaks blood because there's people hiding beneath the sun like the sand bed. Really cool stuff, you know, really amazing stuff and it's 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 awesome the way the blood sort of comes out through the surface of the sand and it's it, it's just really awesome knowing they're sort of assassins laying in wait um to sort of take these guys out the whole end sequence gives the film a lot more scope because it, it rather than just sort of in forests and that kind of thing um much like i mentioned in previous reviews when when a film does change the sort of the landscape and just the visuals um and just gives it that a different color or a different like scenery it does work and this film is no exception it, that end sequence like sort of where it's in the desert it really adds into its terms of like the vastness and scope of the film um, and it really makes the ending as well more memorable it's an ending that does stick in your mind you remember it um <coughs> you know it just makes it a bit more it just varies things up a bit in regards to the narrative and the way the film plays out um here's what like ito is waiting for them on top of the dunes um when the fighting starts you see this guy attack him and you can see there's an amazing amazing uh probably <laughs> it made me laugh at further say because it's just so well done the shot you see the back of this guy's head and ito you see that his sword has come down on this guy um it, it, and it's like it you think okay what's going to happen it's from like i say it's from the back of this dude and then his head just splits right open all in like one shot this guy's head just just splits right open straight down the middle um again no cgi or anything like that all done with practical visual effects and it just looks awesome it really it's a fantastic little bit where it does say you because he, he does the cut and you think well what's you know what damage is that done his head just goes splits right open uh all all in one shot and it's so well done it is really well done um, one of the brothers gets his throat cut and wishes just once that he could have made a cut as clear as that. Um, just, you know, driving on home, uh, like sort of how skilled Ito is. Um, he just wishes, I just wish once I could have done a, you know, a cut as skilled as, like, as skilled as that. Because he just, uh, you know, 
um, to do it that cleanly, even though he knows he's going to die. He's like, I just wanted to wish I could have done a cut like that once in my life. Um, and I love it when it, uh, Ito kills the last guy as well. The way the blood sort of splatters all over the camera, it just like squirts relentlessly all over the camera. Like the camera lens is quite, it's quite low, and um, the camera placement and Ito like this blood is sort of flying all over the camera lens, and it just it just looks awesome. It really does look good. So the very last shot of the film, we have that the female assassin again. Um, after their tender moment, she goes to sort of uh, she comes up behind Ito and sort of goes to um, attack him with her sword. Um, and he draws his, knowing that, you know, well, if this if this is what you're going to do, are you going to really do this? And she drops her sword, knowing that, you know, she's never, ever, ever going to be any match for him. But um, that's sort of a run through of the film. <coughs> and it's, as I mentioned um the very start, if you're going to watch any of the Lone Wolf and Cub films, you definitely check this one out. Um, as I say, Shogun Assassin is the one that was made for Western audiences. But if you're doing, if you're going for the original, you know, if you're going to watch any of them, probably watch this one. But I will try and get through all of the Lone Wolf and Cub films because they are they are awesome. They are really good. And as I say, based on the manga of the same name. Um, but um, as I say, I just hope you enjoyed the review. It's just it's a really fun film. As I say, it's a lot more action in it than the first one. Um, a lot more, it's a lot more violent, it's a lot more comic, like manga like comic book um, kind of action, a lot more bloodletting, a lot more blood being spilt, um, a lot more, um, it's a lot more easier to follow in certain senses as well, because you've basically just got these guys, this clan that are just trying to kill him and things like that, and like I say, the monks of death just make it even more fun with their iron claws and iron fists and everything else, but um, thank you very so much for watching, I will be reviewing Baby Cart to Hades next, and um, yeah, Hope you enjoyed the review and uh, I'll see you again soon.